Beaton. This is the man who needs no introduction. Is anybody here who doesn't know who Marty Kane is? Oh, see, there's a few. You have to introduce yourself to a few people. Only very few. Marty Kane. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, hi. Nice turnout. Thank you. Do we have a clicker? Ooh, and it works. I think so. Oh, technology is wonderful when it works. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm Marty Kane. I. Uh, I'm president of Lake Apacon Historical Museum, but I know most of you folks for a really long time because uh, you can't really do things about Lake Apacon and not crisscross all over the canal because Lake Apacon owes its very existence to the Morris Canal, at least the Lake Apacon we know today. In fact, when people ask us, hey, how, how, since when is Lake Apacon the way it is? It's since that last time that the canal got enlarged in the 1840s. That's kind of when since Lake Apacon has been the same way it is. So um, the two really do go well. Tonight, we're going to talk about something that's a, a little bit different than probably you're used to at one of these programs, because it's not really a direct canal related uh, program, but it's really about an individual that was more responsible than any other, really, for the way that the canal was abandoned uh, in, 18, uh, in uh, 1924, um, Hudson Maxim. Uh, basically, he led the opposition uh, to the canal from about 1910 until it was eventually abandoned. And as we'll talk about a little bit today, you know, it really went with his interests at Lake Apakong. It wasn't that he was against the canal. It was against, he was against the use of the lake's water for anything that would replace the canal. Uh, so Hudson Maxson was a really interesting type of person. Um, he was uh, not, uh, schooled in any kind of normal way. He, he grew up in Maine. Uh, his uh, formal education went to about sixth grade. He had an older brother by the name of Hiram Maxim, who would also uh, wind up extremely famous. It's actually Hiram Maxim was the one that invi uh, invented the Maxim machine gun. Um, and it would be his nephew, uh, Hiram's son, that invented the Maxim silencer. All the same family. Um, there were a, a large number of children, none of them formally schooled in Maine. Hudson wound up here with us, uh, basically in Lake Apakong. And as you can see, Thomas Edison considered him the most versatile man in America. And you kind of get a flavor of that when we finish tonight. Um, that's Hudson. Most of the times you see him, you see him more later in life. And that's just because of photography. Um, he was involved in a lot of different things. We know him here in the Canal Society mainly as the main critic of, of the Morris Canal. But through his life, he took on all types of major issues in the country. Um, and uh, the way that he got to his platform was he's an inventor. You can say an early industrialist. Um, he made his money and fame in explosives. Um, the, his biggest invention was Maximite which will tell you a little bit about the guy that he named it after himself. And he, you know, uh, he was a, a very much um, a man of his times as far as they had pretty big egos and they definitely thought they were right on most issues. And that, that was pretty much Hudson Maxim. As you can see, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that. He, he was an inventor, but he invented things like coffee pots as well as explosives. Um, and, you know, a lot of people say that, that um, you know, uh, experts, that Albert Einstein used a lot of what the work that Hudson Maxim did uh, with, with work that he did later on on um, philosophy of relativity. And he considered himself a real expert on poetry. And he wrote about it. Probably one of the most boring books you'll probably ever read. But he had a lot to say. All right, that's how Hudson is. We normally don't see him as a much younger man. Um, he, he never started out really in the sciences. He kind of wound up in it much more accidentally. In fact, his, his first big project in life was he and a partner wrote a book on penmanship. And they were pretty successful with it um, in the late 1870s. And they, oh, oh, I swear I didn't touch a thing. Okay. Um, and, it, it, you know, we actually have a copy of this in the museum and all, and they sold a lot of these copies. They were op operating out in New England, and that's kind of where he got his start and, and went on for a while. And then uh, that business kind of dried up, and he started working for his uh, brother, Hiram. Um, 
Hiram was like, at that point set up in, in Europe and um, Hudson Maxim went over there and worked for him for a while. And for a while he would kind of uh, bring some of the patents and work over to the United States. It was while he was in, in Europe, actually in England, um, that he met his wife that we would know at Lake Apacum very well, uh, Lillian Durbin. Uh, and to this date, we have things named after her at Lake Apacum, um, like Durbin Avenue. Um, and of course, we have Hudson Hudson Avenue. We have Maxim Drive. So you, you could tell how important they were to us at Lake Apacum. Hudson had been married previously, and he had a son. He was divorced when he was in England. And uh, it's kind of, you know, I don't know if you'd know it immediately, but he was, was 22 years older than Lillian when he met her. Um, she was like 18 and he was 40. Um, and they, he met her, decided immediately he would marry her. And about six weeks later, it happened. They lived for many years and, and actually there were two different brownstones they lived at in Brooklyn. Um, and that was what he made his home. Um, and throughout his life, he made a residence in, in Brooklyn, but, uh, he moved more and more out toward Lake Apakung over the years uh, as a main residence. What brought him up to New Jersey? What brought him up to Lake Apakung? The explosives industry. Um, this part of New Jersey, you could argue, used to be the center of the explosives industry in the United States. Um, you had uh, Picatinny Arsenal. You had um, the Hercules over in uh, Kenville or... Um, and, and, you know, in Lake Apakung, believe it or not, in the area we know as Shore, um, as, uh, Shore Hills today, you had the American Foresight Powder Company. Um, it, it had um, a couple hundred acres. It's amazing that it's all housing today, probably under today's standards, you'd never be able to just, you know, turn up. But what happened was it operated there from the 1880s. Uh, in 1912, it became the Atlas Powder Company. It changed its name. And it operated there into the 1920s. In the late 20s, they decided that they were getting accused of killing too many fish at Lake Apakong and, and kind of a development had gotten too close to them. So they moved a factory out to Pennsylvania. But they were up at Lake Apakong for about 40 years. Um, and that's what brought them up here. Um, what happened was Hudson Maxim was working for his brother for a while and he decided to open up his own company in the United States. He developed a whole bunch of patents that DuPont was interested in. Uh, in the 1890s, he sold all his patents to DuPont. And that's really, I swear, I'm not touching that. Um, and that's where he made all his money, was really selling the patents. And then he went to work for DuPont as a consultant. At, while working as a consultant, DuPont sent him up to American Foresight. Uh, American Foresight at that point was developing explosives for the local mines. As you know, this area had a big mining industry, as you know, from the Mars Canal. I mean, what a lot of the early cargo was. So they were looking for explosives that could work in wet environments. And that's where things like, you know, um, Maxim got involved in. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, he got involved in, in a lot of early kind of explosives. I don't think he normally wore his suit. He, I think this was more of a press photo, but um, worked in in um with a lot of uh nitroglycerin type products and, and explosives in fact you'll notice in some of the photos he did blow his hand off uh in the 1890s the early 1890s when he was working down in howell township um, and he had a prosthetic uh hand for the rest of his life so he basically did everything you know one-handed he also got very involved in, in the torpedoes as um uh, in the years after the uh, Spanish-American War. Okay, so he comes up here uh, right around 1898, starts working with American Foresight, and there's this big lake out there that he knew nothing about. The lake was just really starting to develop as a resort. Maxim gets really interested in it. He rents properties in various parts. He's in River Sticks area of the lake for a while, and, he's, and then in 1901, he buys a big piece of property on the west shore of the lake. Um, during this year, these years, as I've said, tourism was starting to really boom at the lake. Um, from the years from like 1882 
to 1900, some 30 hotels opened on the shores of the lake. It would top in the 1920s at about 40 hotels. So it was a major resort area that he walked into. So he buys this area of the West Shore, which those of you that know the lake today, this would be along Lakeside Boulevard. If you know where the Yacht Club is located, kind of right across, if you're standing on the Yacht Club dock and looking across the shoreline right there, it's all big homes today and things like that. But this is how it would have looked when he bought it. Um, for those of you that know the lake a little bit, this would be Sharps Rock over here. So Maxim buys his property and he kind of builds an estate there. Um, he puts his laboratory all the way up on a hill where you can still find some signs of it today if you go muck through the woods. Um, he has um, his main house. He has his amazing Venetian style boathouse. He builds an observatory that he also uses as an ice house. He has three guest houses on the property, one, two, and one that you don't quite see over here. A really kind of neat carriage house and garage that we'll take a look at a little later. And he has a hotel next door to him. Well, when you have his kind of money and you don't like the way they're running a hotel next door, what do you do? You buy it. And that's what he did. So he ran that hotel also, which was the whole property over here. Um, and there's, you know, a better shot of, of his boathouse. That was the original you know, house he put up and then he built a larger house. Um, the boathouse, uh, he, he built his main house in 1902. The boathouse came in 1904. Um, it, it's a shame that it was taken down in the 1950s. I'm getting used to it coming on and off. Um, it's a shame that uh, in the 1950s, they took it down. It was made of steel and, and uh and stone, um, you know, it, it's more like something to find up at the Thousand Islands, like Bolt Castle or something. Um, unfortunately, there was that period, especially in the 50s or into the 60s, where everything kind of old was looked upon as bad and everything, you know, kind of new was looked upon as good. The person who bought the property after uh, Mrs. Maxim had passed just thought they were being overtaxed on it. They should see the taxes in Hopak Hung now. No offense from our council members that are here tonight. Um, but, um, you know, they thought they were being overtaxed. It needed repointing. So they, they one night in true Maxim style, they blew it up. <laughs> they, they, honest to God. Um, that building actually is still there today, which is where you can kind of see everything. But, uh, it's unfortunate because that was such an amazing structure. Here's Hudson on the top of that. And this shot here was a, a movie they did, um, in, uh, 1918. Uh, it was called Virtuous Wives, uh, uh, it it's, uh, was a, a big silent movie of the fire. Unfortunately, it's one of those 90 plus percent of silent movies that's been lost over the years uh, because it had a lot of lake footage on it. Uh, and we only have stills of that today. And there's Hudson uh, on the lake. And on the property, um, he spent... Later in life, pretty much the, almost the entire year there. That was one of his guest houses. Someone actually came up to me today who um, formerly worked at Wagner College, and he said, there was a poet that used to, you know, that we had a collection of letters between Hudson Maxim and him, and that would have been Edward Markham, who was a very famous uh, early uh, 20th century poet. And uh, he, he wasn't in this cottage. He was in the one next door. In fact, some of you that know Lake Apaco know along Lakeside Boulevard, there's a set of staircase. There's a staircase that goes to nowhere right off of Lakeside Boulevard. Well, when I was a kid, there used to be a cottage still up there. And that was a house. And that was exactly where Edwin Markham used to be. So sometimes it all ties together. Um, you know, amazing piece of property he had there. And, you know, like I said, he had his laboratory there, so he continued to work and do all his uh, research on this property. He loved entertaining people, uh, anybody from uh, the DuPonts to Annie Oakley um, to Ca Commodore Perry, all visited him here at Lake Apakung. No, not in that one, but um, the way people looked then, we do have one, like I'll show you in a little bit, where Rex Beach, the author, is definitely in it. Um, we have some great ones of horses on the property because he was, you know, visited by some um, Jack Crawford, who was known as the Poet Scout, and he brought his horses with him and all. It's kind of neat stuff. That's Rex Beach. We do know that. Um, 
I think one of the other ones worked for Edison. And after that, I have no idea. And this woman is very intriguing. I don't know what to make of her. Now, even though he only had one uh, hand, he loved to drive himself around the lake. There's lots of stories about how bad a driver he was and how fast he drove on, on the roads, which back then you can only imagine what the roads were like, you know, around the borough of Opakung in like the 19 teens. You know, they're not super like straight now. Uh, um, one of the things he invented was the game of war. It was made to be played similar to chess. He thought it was going to become quite the thing. We do have a couple of sets of it at the um, museum if you want to want to take out and read the rules and see what you think of it. Uh, it never became a major seller, though. But he loved playing tennis. He loved the box, even with his one uh, hand. At, yeah, yeah, they, that's actually, you can see a good view of it. He got refitted in Europe uh, right before the end of his life with one that evidently was a lot more flexible as they started making some progress in that area. Ah, uh, there he is with Lillian. Okay. And, and you know, we, we love this one from 1922 because, um, you know, he, he really was a huge figure at Lake Apakung. He was a councilman for um, about 15 years. He was a, a board member at the Lake Opakung Yacht Club. Uh, he was a founder of a competing yacht club a few years later. But he didn't like the way they were running the Lake Opakung Yacht Club, so he started his own. Um, the Maxim Park Yacht Club, notice the name. Um, and, uh, you know, but more interestingly, uh, he was involved with Every aspect of lake life, that's Joe Cook, a famous actor who also had his house there in Estelle Glasser. There's still an area of New Jersey of uh, Lake Opakin that we kind of know as Glasser today. That, that was the daughter of the postmaster and all. She was an opera singer, singer. And, you know, they used to do these carnivals. You know, this one's 1926. So it was just a year before Hudson Maxim died. But you can see they had a pretty good time up there. Okay. This is where it really starts tying in with the Morris Canal, if you're wondering, what the hell is he talking about all this stuff? Um, Hudson Maxim had money. He saw the potential for the development of Lake Opakung. In 1910, he buys out um, the Byram uh, Cove Land Company, which uh, owned about 650 acres of property right along the lake shore and two and a half miles of shoreline. So he's starting to develop the lake. Well, the canal drew a lot of water. Um, it was thirsty creature. And remember, we weren't just feeding the canal, we were feeding the Muskinekong River. So you read the stories um, in that period when the lake started developing as a resort, and it was not unusual for the lake to be down two and three feet by August. You know, you start dropping the lake two and three feet and you're trying to run a hotel, there's a lot of kind of mucky stuff in front of your property and it doesn't smell that great. And it's also hard to get your boats in and out. And remember at this time, almost all transportation around the lake was by steamboat. So, you know, the canal is kind of like a natural enemy because it's thirsty and it takes a lot of water out of the lake. So as soon as he really gets involved with the land company, he becomes this big critic of the canal and Quite honestly, uh, once the um, the Central Railroad of New Jersey came up to Nolan's Point in 1882, um, it was pretty much uh, set that the, that was the end of the economic viability of the canal. Because once you didn't need it to take all the iron ore out of Jefferson Township and bring it out through the canal, you weren't going to make money on the canal anymore. So really from the 1880s, you can argue to the 1920s, the whole fight was what are you going to do with the canal? And Hudson Maxim didn't care what you did with it as long as it no longer needed water from Lake Opakung. Well, being that was the single largest source of water for the canal, it made it very hard to have any kind of viable canal if you weren't taking water from Lake Opakung. So that's really kind of where, um, you know, they I will say they became enemies. Um, and here you can see a nice, you know, advertising brochure for the land he was going to develop. And those of you that know the borough of Opakung, and I know there's a few in the house tonight, um, this was all the lots he wound up on his property. So as you can see, there were some existing properties already before he bought, but he bought all the 
being a colorblind guy. I think it's in pink. Um, is that the color here? Okay. That's all his property. Went all the way into Byram Cove, and it kind of ended just where the Borough of Hopakung ended at the time uh, because that was all Byram on the other side of it back then. So he had a lot of property that he wanted to develop, and he needed lakefront property. So he becomes this big, you know, uh, critic, and he has um, the power, the money to really become the main critic of the canal. And as you can see, you know, he's get involved in, in many, you know, different ways. He starts writing articles. Um, he starts producing things that most people couldn't afford to take on. Like here's like a map he did, and as you notice, prepared for the Morris Canal. And that, as you know, Oh, no, that was the major, the first real investigation commission about really abandoning the canal was 1912. Uh, and Hudson is all over that, you know, with photographs, with, you know, books that he wrote, all kinds of information he's feeding into this. You know, some of the books you'll be impressed with. Yeah, it did, it did, yeah, like, yeah, it's a pretty good article. Um, so, you know, he's really, be, you know, if you will, he's leading the effort and he's also going out and making speeches as you see him here in Dover. And he's giving testimony, of course, down to the legislature. So he leads the effort. He has the money to hire experts. He's making it very difficult for the canal. Well, at the same time, you know, other groups are recognizing that, yeah, the canal's not making it economically. What can we do with this? So you have the whole concept of the parkway, right? Turn it into what something that would be very appealing today, right? The, you know, basically a trail along the Mars Canal, like the Mars Canal Greenway, except it would have water still in it. You know, that, that was the idea of this, that you would turn the canal into like this recreational um path across the state great idea at the time but you still need water in it and that's why you know maxim wound up really jumping on this one because he saw this as a big threat because it would continue indefinitely um and you know here you can see a little bit um the other thing was they wanted to use lake opakong as a backup water supply or reserve similar like what uh, greenwood lake is but that also you know really threatened that they'd be drawing water from lake opakong through the canal out to where they need, needed it. So that was an, another, you know, alternate use of the canal during this time period that he kind of jumped on. All right, ultimately successful, December 1st, 1922, um, the Morris Canal, the legislature votes to abandon the canal. Um, great, you know, uh, victory for him personally uh, and for really Lake Apakung because it was felt that once the canal was gone, every summer you'd have a full Lake of Pakung. All right, we know that that's not quite the case, um, but uh, at the time, um, that really did resolve most of the issues that the lake faced. Now, the canal was just one little aspect of what Maxim was involved in through these years. He was always writing about different, you know, defense-related issues, like, you know, when first the airplanes came out, you know, here he is, you know, um, given his thoughts on the issues of the day. Um, he took a big issue on women's suffrage. He was for it, which was not that, that common amongst a men of, you know, industrial kind of types. And he had a very strong opinion about prohibition. He was against it. In fact, um, he tried arguing that if you say that, um, alcohol is illegal. He tried making the connection and coffee should also be illegal because it has similar stimulants to the body. Didn't go that far with that argument, but uh, he wrote heavily on both of these and spoke a lot. Um, as you can see, he was a strongly against smoking. Another issue that a lot of people didn't speak out on at that point, because a little verbose about it. And you notice even at the time they called him the explosive wizard. He thought he was a really good cook. 
Now here's this recipe for spaghetti. Um, he swore he made the best baked beans. Um, and he liked me. He, he was found in a kitchen, you know, and there again, you know, with his one hand, but he, uh, this is something he really did enjoy. And yeah, so it's written for men by men. I know when people look at the recipe, they go, oh my God, that would be terrible. Well, if you want to try it, let me know how it works out. I'll send it to you. Um, they were really involved. He was big. He not only he um, got together with all poet groups. Um, he wrote his book on poetry. He wrote a little bit of his own, as in this Christmas card he put out in nineteen uh, fifteen. Um, when there was a Japanese beetle problem, he offered his opinion. He had his, a strong opinion about the chestnut blight. Um, you know, he really pretty much got involved. He was a person that, like, you could have lived in Oshkosh. But you knew Hudson Maxim because you always saw him in the paper for something or another. And you kind of just knew him as the, that explosive guy that had something to say. And he did ads. You know, it's not just like, I'm not that new in air. It's, you know, here one that he did for Elgin Watch. There you go. Okay. Hudson Maxim was an interesting guy. I think he liked pretty women, which is a good thing. Um, but he did not like perfume. And if you stayed at his house and he always had guests over, it was just a known thing. You just didn't wear perfume around him. He found it kind of repugnant. Well, when they were starting out what would become the Miss America contest, um, 1921, it was just known as like the Atlantic City swimming, you know, uh, and this was at a time where it was almost bordered on a line of scandalous because of the swimsuits, even though they were nothing like swimsuits today. Um, but they wanted a King Neptune that would lead the parade in of all these bathing beauties. Well, Hudson Maxim had a certain look to him with his beard. So he agreed in 1921 and 1922 to be King Neptune. Um, and so we have some great photos of him down in Atlantic City. A lot of what they did, as you can tell from the background, it was extremely politically incorrect. Um, but uh, it was popular at the time. There he is with the first uh, Miss America. Uh, I think it's Margaret Gorman. He was a confidant of like uh, presidents. Um, at least three of them he spent some time with. Um, you have uh, Harding. You have Coolidge. There's Hudson Maxim at the White House. And Teddy Roosevelt was the one he was definitely closest with because uh, Hudson Maxim got very involved in the lead up to uh, World War I. Um, he was really a leader in what they called the preparedness movement, as was Theodore Roosevelt. So the two of them became pretty close during that time period. So like that photo is in the museum collection, which is you know inscribed to Hudson Maxim, Theodore Roosevelt. He is also the one president that may have visited Lake Opakong after he was out of office in the teens. Um, it had been written in a couple publications that Theodore Roosevelt had been there. We've just never found anything to prove it one way or another. We know the other two presidents he visited at the White House. All right, this was a cop. This was a book um, that he wrote in 1915 that uh, is a, is a, uh, attributed to being one of the main reasons uh, the United States entered World War I. Um, it was Defenseless America. He basically wrote about a foreign force, which everybody thinly saw as Germany. Um, sailing basically into New York Harbor, having longer guns, taking over the whole northern New Jersey uh, armaments industry and basically conquering the United States. Well, in 1915, it didn't take long. They turned it into a movie um, that was called The Battle Cry of Peace. It was strongly supported by Theodore Roosevelt and a number of other folks. And, you know, movies were new then. They were silent, but it, it had this incredible effect on people. You know, seeing all your favorite um, heroes and heroines in the movie basically killed because, you know, America hadn't paid attention to being prepared for war. And, you know, at that time, there wasn't much of an, you know, an industry or a, uh, an army. And it's like, you know, his only enemy preparedness. You see some of the stuff that was put out then. And, um, you know, it would be definitely propaganda in nature. 
but it had a strong effect in America. That and, you know, like the sink in Lusitania, all, all the, some of the main reasons that you see for the entry into World War I. And, you know, just some of the things. And uh, it was a, it was a huge it was a huge thing. And he was basically the author of the movie, if you will, because it was based on his book. Here it is at the Baker Theater in Dover. And you can see the producer, you know, acknowledged me to Hudson Maxim. All right. America gets into the war. They start a Naval Advisory Board. Uh, and you know who's in it? Hudson Maxim, Thomas Edison, figures we know. He gets very active during that period. Uh, and he was remained lifelong friends. That was like a, a really well-known people. The two of them were very, very close. Here, uh, Hudson Maxim is down in West Orange. And Thomas Edison would come visit him up at the lake. This one's really fun because it's on this, uh, the steps of what was then the Department of War before they built the Pentagon. And, you know, you, ha you can find... Uh, Thomas Edison, you may even find Ford in this photo. I don't remember if he was in there or not. Hudson Max is on the top. But this one's really neat. A very, very young secretary of the Navy by the name of Franklin Roosevelt while, before he was in the wheelchair. And so that, that's really kind of a neat photo that we love. All right, so we go to war. Um, and after the war, you know, Maxim is, stays true has veterans over at his house up at the lake, remains very active in that movement. Um, for Hudson Maxim, basically the 20s, his last great success, you could argue, would have been, um, you know, the, the canal uh, was abandoned officially in 24. In 25, he, he hosted the opening of the Hopakong State Park Fountain, something that actually we just went through a restoration that will be open this year. It hasn't operated in over 20 years. Um, and, uh, he, when he dies to, uh, two years later, um, in, in 1927, very appropriately, a monument is put up in Hopakong State Park in his honor. And, uh, actually, if you see, that's the museum building today, and that's where the monument actually sits. Well, if you would have come here during the Morris Canal, you see there's the museum building, or it was then the lock tender's house. So they put the... <sighs> They put the monument um, kind of right in the area where the Morris Canal would have been. Actually, he's kind of like looking down at the canal, kind of giving it the finger. Um, you know, it, it's kind of neat to see, you know, why they picked that, you know, location for it. Um, the monument we had redone um, about eight years ago. It was in really bad shape there. We brought it in, had it restored. So it looks uh, pretty, pretty good today. Um, and we try to keep, uh, some snap, yellow snapdragons usually in front of it in the summer. Cause that was his favorite flower. Um, parts of him that are still around today, his house, unfortunately is gone. Uh, but there's a, a Sussex County, um, monument or a historic marker that notes location, um, on the property actually that still remains. His ice house and observatory are still on a neighboring lot. Um, one of his guest houses is still on the other side of Lakeside Boulevard. Um, next to his house, actually, um, it, it in this house over here, it's been greatly renovated, but that was another one of his guest houses. His um, his carriage house or his garage is a separate property today. It was really interesting because Maxim was interested in kind of, you know, technology and all. It's built behind this facade of um, hollow tiles that they used at the ice houses at the lake. So it was a great way of, um, uh, you know, really uh, uh, insulating your house um, with these hollow tiles. And there's one other house at Lake Opakung which was the superintendent of the ice house company that's completely built of these hollow tiles also. So it's kind of an interesting house. In fact, it used to be that hollow tiles were the outside and then he put kind of like a brick face over it. Um, as I already mentioned, we do have roads around the lake named after Hudson, after Maxim, after Durbin. For years, our uh, public school in Hopakong uh, was named 
it started as a River Six school, it became the Hudson Maxim School. Um, it operated like that for many years. It's actually now closed. In the latter years, it was only kindergarten and first grade. Um, and, and it started as a one-room schoolhouse. Um, and now it's actually a, a privately owned school. But uh, around town, you still find lots of people that remember is the Hudson Maxim School. Um, our Maxim Glen Park, which uh, started, oh gosh, about 20 years ago now, um, remembers him. All that property uh, where the parks are was all donated by Maxim. In fact, a lot of the church properties were donated by the Maxims. A lot of the park properties were because they had 650 acres and they were trying to develop a community. Um, where his explosive factory was down in Howell Township, this is something like, you know, Joe and industrial architects, uh, I'm sorry, industrial archaeologists would get really involved in because um, there's nothing really to see of his factory unless you go deep into the woods in Howell Township along a road called Maxim Road. You can still find, you know, a lot of the foundations of the buildings of the explosive uh, industry that was there. Um, as you can see, um, they developed it uh, in uh, the 20s. As Max, New Jersey, it doesn't really go by that name anymore. It's just a part of Howell Township, but it's just another legacy. And that is basically, you know, when he sold all his patents, he sold that, his patents, and everything to DuPont. And that leaves us with just a little quote to end the evening with Hudson, which is uh, kind of nice. So with that, if there's any questions that I might better handle about Lake Opakung or Hudson Maxim or, I don't know, life in general, I'll try. Yeah. On your very first slide, there's a picture, a photo of him lighting a cigar with a stick of dynamite. Yeah, he did that for a, a newspaper. I mean, I'm sorry, a magazine article. Um, it's a pretty famous photo. Um, I, whether it was really, you know, dynamite or not, I'm not really sure. But it was a great photo at the time, yes. It very well might have been. They certainly didn't hold to the safety standards that we would consider today. In fact, you know, it's funny because at the American Foresight Plant, as well as Hercules, as well as Picatinny, if you look at um, the newspapers of the day, they'd have an, a, a pretty much an explosion there maybe one, once a year. And that was considered kind of the cost of doing business. And as long as you didn't kill anybody outside the plant, it was considered an acceptable risk, honestly. Um, and, you know, there's a, a neat article of uh, Maxim kind of defending the industry in which he basically says that no one has ever been killed outside the grounds of the factory. Um, so, you know, really, what's the problem? <laughs> um, but that was this part, you know, of and, 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 you know, even as kids growing up around the lake, there were constant explosions at Hercules, Picatinny. Um, so yeah yeah there's a place uh, i think it's called hudson farms there's an exclusive uh shooting club somewhere out that way too right this property um what happened it's funny um hudson it, it started as the hudson guild farm and it actually is named after the hudson guild of new york city it's just that one of those coincidences of the name um the hudson guild was an early um social house like kind of the whole from like you know Lillian Wald and that whole thing. Um, and they bought property out in the middle of nowhere. They considered it Nekong at the time. It wasn't even part of Hopakong when it, they bought the property. Um, so it's right on the Sparta Stanhope Road. And um, what was um, about a 600, and 600 acre farm or so, um, a gentleman by the name of Peter Kellogg has put together the Hudson Farm Foundation. And they now own 5,000 acres uh, in Hopakung, uh, Byram, and a little into Sparta, and I don't know, Andover, thank you. I knew my Hopakung folks were going to bail me out tonight yet. Um, it's amazing, and it's almost all with conservation easement. So even if you, you're not crazy about the idea that it's a shooting club, they have preserved 5,000 acres in that area, and it's just amazing. It, and they have uh, you know forestry. Uh, they have, it, it's amazing what they've done there. Um, so while it's a shooting club, it is found in an incredible what they, what they've done to maintain that property. 
And, um, you know, it was going to be developed by Havnanian, most likely, when he swooped in and bought the initial property, and he's just kept expanding onto it. Um, there's wonderful walks on the property that are open to the public. In fact, um, there's one on May the 8th. When's the block party? The, the 18th, right? So it's the 11th is the walk, right? The Hopakong walk is the 11th this year. It's open to everybody. And we like the older you are, the better. Because everybody that walks in that gets a dollar for every year of their age. And you get to drop this funny money into boxes for uh, local charities. And the charities get real money from Hudson Farm for it. So like if you're an active 80-year-old, we really want to have you there. Um, you know, it's really good. Yeah. You know, we're going to get to that. Yes. Um, the thing that I act, and I mean, now that I have two council members in the audience, I can really, uh, I've never understood why like Hopakung doesn't say like, welcome to Hopakung, birthplace of the Appalachian Trail, because um, the discussion that started the Appalachian Trail actually took place in Hudson Farm in the borough of Hopakung. Um, and it's widely accepted by the folks that were involved in that, that the concept actually started there. And it was from there they decided to publish an article, which is what really gave place birthplace to the Apple. In fact, the original Appalachian Trail was going to come right through Hudson Farm, but they, they kind of moved it west because it didn't quite work. But they developed a trail from Hudson Farm at the time that you get over to the Appalachian Trail. So, yeah. Yeah. Where did he get his degree in chemistry at the university? I don't know that he had a formal one. I think he only had honorary ones. And he, he, he was putting these chemicals, explosives together to make or was he using other people's? No, I mean, you know, basically he, he got his experience working with his brother. His brother had no formal degree either. Um, and, you know, they worked upon what other people were doing. At that point, you know, because of like the nobles, you know, what we know, the Nobel Peace Prize and all, uh, they advanced, they were much further advanced in Europe on explosives. So that's why they went over there and that's why they exported a lot of it over here. And, and you know, um, the, really their, their biggest thing that they worked with was explosives that could work in wet environments uh, for the, uh, the mining industry in, in the United States. Techniques that were or developed. Yeah, they, you know, he did come up with improvements to it, which like Maximite was his own patent, but it, based on other people's research, he just took it up a notch. You know, like Maximite was, I think, 50% more explosive than uh, dynamite, you know. You can get pretty messed up playing that. Yeah, ask him about his hand. <laughs> and, you know, he didn't trust doctors in New Jersey, so he wrapped up his hand and he took a train back to New York to get it treated. Yeah. That is, Yeah. Uh, you know, and when you say smokeless gunpowder, a lot of people take credit for it. But yeah, that was where his, a lot of his patents were in. Exactly. Exactly. Anything else? Yeah. I have a story, but I'd like the microphone to tell it. I, you know, I, 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 I go with my boss. It's about, it's. Thank you. Um, I'm not too sure what time period this was, but it was had to be obviously before Hudson Maxim passed away. Um, that there was a photograph of his touring car and he's driving it, and he was missing his left hand, I believe. And so the steering wheel had something known as a suicide knob. And these are very cool. These are very cool to drive with. And um, he came into, he drove it to, up to King's store in Ledgewood. And it's not a canal store. It is a store built on a turnpike road. I think might maybe the Union Turnpike. Yeah, the Union Turnpike. Um, and... So it was, it was built in 1817. At any rate, in the early 20th century, 
this young girl named Goldie Weller worked there. And I got the story from her nephew. Um, and Hudson Maxim comes in one day and he's grump, 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 grump about the Morris Canal. And she said, Mr. Maxim, I like the Morris Canal. And he runs out of the store, jumps into his touring car, takes off, and um, comes back you know, 10 minutes later or so with one of his pamphlets. I have a, I pack and have one, is a book, a very thin book with wood as the cover and the wooden covered book. And he came back into the store and plopped this book down on the counter. You read this young lady and you'll learn about how bad the Morris Canal is. And uh, then, you know, the family treasures that book. Uh, but I just thought it was such a funny story about, you know, it kind of pulled together everything you said about. It. Yeah. And we still have some of those copies in the museum. The, the wood isn't so good on some of those copies of the book, but it's still there. Yeah, Joe. Yes. The canal got abandoned. And so the canal got abandoned and Hudson got his way and the state of New Jersey got the got the lake. And the lake still feeds the Muskinetcong River. But since the state has it, didn't they build a pipe to actually connect the lake over the hill down to the Rockaway River drainage? Yeah, they've they've um for drought conditions, they've done it twice over the years. Um it's not really operational these days, uh, but they did it in the 1960s when we had those terrible uh, dry uh, years, and they did it in the 19, it was 80s. Um, they they redid it, um, and they basically would pump the water along the old railroad right away, the Central Railroad of New Jersey, to Booton, to the reservoir, you know, uh, you know where the good pizzeria is, and or yeah, yeah. Um, and they yeah, and and so yes. Uh, we actually got asked recently about are those pipes like usable? And the answer is no, if you've seen them and as the pumps were removed and everything. But technically we are a backup because we are owned by the state of New Jersey, which always causes a lot of interesting issues because you have 2,200 homes around the shore of the lake, which are all private homes. You have one large public area, which is Hopakong State Park, which is where the canal used to flow from. That's where our lock tenders house is and all that. Um, and you have a county park, but the whole water itself is owned by the state of New Jersey, as is Lake Muskinac, Kung and all, all because uh, the state took over all those properties that were part of the Morris Canal system. So, and like we say, you know, Lake Opakung is the way we know it because of the Morris Canal. Now, you know, in its natural state, it was 12 feet lower than it is today, thereabouts. So, yeah. Can you tell us when your open? Tomorrow, 12 to 3. All right, so almost like I put you in the audience, Pierce. That was like pretty good. Thank you. Yeah, tomorrow from twelve to three, we'll open, and we, and we put our hours on the website. Um, and uh, you like you know for the block party, like a packing block party, we're there from like ten to four and things like that. Yeah, the Lake Opakung block party is on the eighteenth uh, of May, if I have it right. Um, without my yes, the Cal Society is loyal supporters of the block party, and on a good day. We got a day like we had like yesterday. Uh, we'd have four thousand people in there, you know. So uh, it's a really fun day on the lake. Uh, it's over two hundred, um, uh, or you know, stands and things. Um, we have uh, boat rides on the lake on both the Miss Lauder and some private boats. It, it's just a, a really nice day to come up to the lake. Yeah, um, well, for, you know, what happened was the last two years, the parks were free. So um, this year is the first year they, they covered or announced we're going back to paying for the parks. So I don't know how that's all going to shake out, to be honest with you. But for two years, you just rode into the park. So I kind of got me out of practice. I'm not sure how to answer your question. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, I think you will be able to if they go back to the way it was. <laughs> Yeah, the federal one you have to pay for now, but it's Best Buy. But yes. 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 
the way the federal used to be. Yeah, the federal used to be, and now the federal, and some of them are, it, it's a base rate, but then there's a premium for certain parts on top of it. Yeah, I think you still get it for 75 bucks, which is still probably a best buy for life. I'm handing it back to Joe before we get thrown out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, one was, where can I see the Hudson Maxim poetry, like the Christmas card you showed and more? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some of it we have on display at the museum. Other ones, we take research requests all the time from people who want to come in and see things that aren't normally on display. That particular one I think might be on. Um, but yeah, um, our Hudson Maxim collection is fairly extensive because um, of all his private papers, the really, really good stuff. Um, Lillian Maxim's second husband, she remarried a number of years after Hudson died, married a lawyer. And um, they maintained the property until her death in 52. Um, he gave the really good stuff from Hudson to the New York Public Library. And then a lot of stuff went down to the Hagley Library, DuPont down in uh, Delaware. And just a whole bunch of it just sat at Lake Apakung and it wound up in our collection. So we have several linear feet of, of documents on Hudson Max. So we have a really good collection for people doing research. In fact, the person that did um, Blood Brothers, the book about Hiram and Hudson Maxim, because they didn't get along well in most of their lives. Um, it was, uh, remember the man from Uncle, Ian, Mac um, um, what was it, uh, David McCallan? Well, his brother, Ian, wrote the book, Blood Brothers, and it was so cool when David McCallum drove him out to the museum. He never came in. He slept in the car, but it was still so cool meeting him. Another was uh, we once had an option on the Woodport Property Owners Association Clubhouse property. Uh, this person is curious about the number of property owners associations there are surrounding the lake. All right. I'm going to have I guess at that we still have a number of active ones, but a, a number of them have gone out of business in recent years. Like the King Cove Association went out of business. Um, the uh, what the heck was the name? There was one up in Woodport, actually. The um, it's right near Liffey Island. They went out of business. What happened is uh, people stopped paying dues, so some go out of business. But we probably still have oh a good good ten or so that are active today where they have their meetings and all, whether it's a Kingsland, um, Lake Forest, um, uh, East Shore Estates, Wildwood Shores. You know, it's a, I'm guessing 10 or 12 and probably I'll go home and name about five more, but yeah. Uh, so there's still a lot, but some have closed over the years, you know, just because people went in different directions. Last one, this is for me. Uh, you saw pictures of Hudson Maxim with uh, Edison and potentially Ford. Ford and Edison and Firestone famously took those car camping trips. They sort of invented the hobby. They didn't invite Hudson. They didn't invite him? Okay. <laughs> they did not invite Hudson. I think Hudson was a little cantankerous at times. Yeah, Edison was really, you know, the one that really got along with him. There are some famous people in that photo because that's they, they were the scientific minds of the day that came together to really work on projects for the war, the war effort. Um, in the camp ah, you know, that could be it. I like that. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, uh, you know, look, they had, you know, a lot of the folks at that time period had personalities larger than life. And, you know, he was one of them. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Marty. Okay, a little, a little business. I'm not wearing this hat just to keep my head warm. We've got new hats and new shirts in the office. Please join us afterwards. Uh, people to thank. Bobby, thank you for the salads. Tim for getting the sandwiches. Our, our tech staff for finally making the presentation work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Janice for managing the office and keeping us all safe and legal. We have a couple of new members tonight. Raise your hands, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glad to have you aboard. We've got lots of events coming up. We've got... Um... Yes. Steve Lauf, who was telling naughty jokes over to, to make sure that the sound uh, was working. 
Uh, what will canal day, June 22. Please save the date. Uh, we're going to make another beautiful day out of it. And uh, we'll have one. Lots of buildings up and lots of things to do. So please join us for, for that and lots of other events throughout the rest of the year. We're going to be busy, busy, busy. Um, archives. John, wave your hand, our archivist. Our archives are now open for research. We have to make an appointment, but we've got lots and lots of great stuff. And uh, John knows where it's all at now. So, and if you don't have time to visit us in person, although we hope you and some of you folks have come to, to visit us. And so you can use our website to access our, our uh, archives online. And uh, John, we've got a couple of thousand items that you can uh, uh, find online. And a lot of them you can uh, actually see pictures of. And uh, we're making wonderful progress and getting making our archives uh, useful. Uh, thoughts or questions, folks? Sir? $15. Bargain. <laughs> Lou? You can always do volunteers. Oh. Bobby, you want to say something about volunteers? We're having our special luncheon. Waterloo and it's being um, catered by the church there and the support the church and uh, it's open to anybody who wants to volunteer and sign up and help us. You don't have to do it all the time or a day here or there um, and to learn a lot about the canal. Have a lot of fun. So much going to be. Yep. Uh, we're not sure. I think it's going to be a new bar. Okay, that's that's still in the work, still in the planning, but it's going to be a great event. Um, we have a lot of dedicated volunteers that allow us to do our programming at Waterloo, and we have a great time doing it. It's wonderful. We might even get a chance to play with the grist mill again. If we can get it put back together again, Mr. Steve, who could fix almost everything. Except for the, uh... Except... <laughs> Except for the computer. And eventually, we hope to be making our uh, agreement with uh, the borough of Wharton and actually being able to do program regular programming at the newly restored Lock uh, Tenders House uh, at Lock Two, Easton in, in, in Wharton Borough. So we're looking forward to that. But that's going to take people to uh, give us a little bit of time every once in a while to come and bring that site back to life, sir. It is going to be. Um, yeah, it's it's usually the third Saturday in in, in uh, okay okay. I thought I had my list here, but I don't. Um, we'll have it up on our website. Uh, it's usually the third Saturday in in August. So please uh, put that on your calendars as well. Okay, we're going to close up here. We're going to move over to the office. We've got newsletters and member membership brochures, and the our John will be in the archives. And so please continue to uh, be with us as uh, McKelvey. A little booklet preserving New Jersey trolley cars up here. <laughs> Help yourself. Finally, our next program meeting is going to be in May, third. <clears throat> Uh, Friday in May, and we're going to have uh, Ryan from uh, McCullough Hall talking about uh, uh, George McCullough. So we're going from one end of the story to the other end of the story. And they all involve like a backup. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Tim, did you have a question? Uh, We've had done, we've, we have done, uh, we we're scheduled to do three different programs. We've already done two. Uh, we'll be um, the 14th, is it? I'll, I'll be doing the last of the three at, at talking about the Morris Canal Greenway at McCullough Hall uh, on a Sunday, April 14th. Thank you again for joining us tonight. <laughs>